in a previous video, I let you in on a little secret. Not all chemical reactions proceed from reactants to products. Some of them proceed from products to reactants as well, and under certain conditions, we achieve what's called a dynamic chemical equilibrium. And in some cases, we can even analyze quantitatively the nature of that chemical equilibrium and figure out whether it is product favored or reactant favored. That is, whether it lies to the right or lies to the left. But, Clearly, since this is something that's relatively new to us, we have to understand that all systems, even equilibrium systems, or those systems that will act to achieve equilibrium, aren't always going to be at equilibrium. And even if they are, what happens if we change one of those equilibrium conditions? How will the system respond? And so we're going to take a look at two ways in which we can analyze a system to establish how it's going to achieve equilibrium, and if already at equilibrium, how it's going to respond if we change something. So the first thing that we're going to do is quantitatively analyze how a system is going to achieve equilibrium if we're not sure if the system that we're analyzing is at equilibrium. And in order to do this, we use something called the reaction quotient. Now, the reaction quotient is derived in almost exactly the same way that the equilibrium constant is. That is, it's derived from the equilibrium equation that we analyze, and we raise the concentration of the reactants and products to the appropriate exponent, representing the coefficient from the balanced chemical equation, and we have the products in the numerator and the reactant concentrations in the denominator. Now what we do in these scenarios is we take the value that we calculate for this reaction quotient and we compare it to the equilibrium constant. So if we encounter a scenario where the QC, the reaction quotient, equals the KC, then we have a situation in which the system is at equilibrium. So if we have a scenario in which the concentrations we use to calculate QC result in a QC that is greater than the KC, what that tells us is our system is not at equilibrium. In order for our system to be at equilibrium, the QC will have to decrease. And in order for that to happen, the concentration that represents the value in the numerator, that is the concentration of the products, will have to decrease. And the concentration of the substances that are in the denominator, that is the reactants, those will have to increase. Now, because this is a closed equilibrium system, the only way in which this will be achieved is if we have a greater amount of product producing reactant, or we have a shift towards the reactant side. That is, we have a shift to the left. Now, if we take a look at a scenario in which we have values that result in a QC that is less than the KC, what that tells us is in order for equilibrium to be established in this system, the QC will have to increase. And in order for that to happen, the value in the numerator, that is the concentration of the products, they will have to go up. And the value in the denominator, that is the concentration of the reactants, will have to go down. And as we've said, since this is a closed equilibrium system, the only way in which this is going to occur is if we have a shift to the right or towards the product side. So the QC allows us to quantitatively analyze if a system is at equilibrium, and if not, how it is going to shift to, to achieve equilibrium. But what if we run into a scenario where we have a system that's already at equilibrium, but one of the conditions under which that equilibrium system exists changes. Well, thanks to this guy, Henri-Louis Le Chatelier, we can answer that question. Le Chatelier's principle basically states that if a stress is placed on a system that is at equilibrium, that the equilibrium system will respond to counteract that stress. And specifically, in introductory chemistry, we're going to take a look at three ways in which an equilibrium system can be stressed. We are going to take a look at a change in concentration, we are going to take a look at a change in pressure due to a change in volume, and we're going to take a look at how a change in temperature might impact an equilibrium system. So let's imagine a scenario where we have a system that's at equilibrium, and we add more reactant. Well, according to Le Chatelier's principle, the system's going to respond by using up that excess reactant, and it does so by forming more product, or shifting to the right. Or if we were to take a look at the flip side of that, and we decrease the concentration of the reactant, the system would respond by increasing the concentration of the reactant, or producing more reactant by shifting to the left. Now, if we think about why that's the case, well, if we're adding more reactant, that means there's going to be more reactant particles to collide, so initially, the rate of the forward, that is, reactant-forming product, is going to be greater than the product-forming reactant, until such time that those rates re-establish and re-establish the value for K. And it's also worth noting that that value for K is going to remain unchanged if the temperature remains unchanged. Now, speaking of temperature, if we were to change temperature, it's going to depend on whether the reaction is endothermic or exothermic in the forward direction. 
So let's take a look at a scenario then where the reaction is exothermic in the forward direction. You may remember from our discussion of thermochemistry that when something is exothermic, we see that energy represented on the product side. So if we are to increase the temperature under which this reaction occurs, you can almost visualize it kind of like concentration, although it's, it's not quite. But if we increase the amount of heat available to the system, that favors the product side. Or another way of thinking about it is the reaction is going to utilize or use up that excess heat. It's going to decrease the heat or energy available to that system. So it's going to do so by moving to the reactant side or shifting to the left. On the flip side of this, if we were to decrease the energy available to the system, the system would respond by trying to increase that energy or shifting to the right. If the system was endothermic in the forward direction, and again you might remember that this means that the energy is found on the reactant side, if we were to decrease the energy available to the system, the system's going to respond by trying to increase that energy, so, so it's going to shift to the reactant side. If we increase the energy available to the system, the system's going to utilize that excess energy or try and decrease it, and it's going to do so by shifting to the right. So it is important to understand when analyzing changes in temperature to an equilibrium system, whether you're analyzing a system that is endothermic or exothermic in the forward direction. So the final stress that we're going to take a look at deals with changes in pressure to an equilibrium system. And really this only comes into play when we're dealing with equilibrium systems that contain molecules of gas, and more specifically when those molecules of gas or moles of gas on the reactant and the product side are unequal. And it really only comes into play if there's an accompanying change in volume. And we have to remember the relationship between volume and pressure. We have to remember that it's an inverse relationship. That is, if we increase the volume of a container, the pressure of that system is going to decrease. And conversely, if we were to decrease the volume of that container, the pressure of the system would increase. But if we take a look at how we're going to analyze this, even though it's actually the volume that is impacting this equilibrium system, for students first learning how this is going to impact the equilibrium system, it's usually easier to think about it in terms of pressure. So pressure is just the force per unit area. And if we think about a gas, the gas exerts a pressure on its container by colliding against the walls of the container. If we have more gas particles, it's going to exert more pressure. If there are fewer gas particles, it's going to exert less pressure. So if we have an equilibrium system that has an unequal number of gas molecules, like this one that has become fairly common to us. This is the Haber process, by the way, if you're not familiar with it. If we take a look at this reaction, we can see that there are a greater number of gas molecules on the reactant side than there is on the product side. So arguably, the reactant side would exert a greater pressure on the walls of its container than the product side would. And so if we change the equilibrium system by, say, increasing the volume, this increase in volume is going to lead to a decrease in pressure. So the system, according to Le Chatelier's principle, would then respond by trying to increase the pressure. So it's going to shift to the side with a greater number of gas molecules, in this case the reactant side. If we were to increase the pressure of the system, by decreasing the volume of the container, then the system is going to try to alleviate some of that pressure by changing to the side or shifting to the side. It has a fewer number of gas molecules. So in the case of this reaction, it is going to shift to the product side. Now, speaking of pressure, it is worth noting that if the pressure change is not due to an accompanying change in volume, let's say we just add an inert gas like nitrogen or neon or argon, that it doesn't actually impact the equilibrium system, even if there are an unequal number of moles or molecules of gas on the reactant side or product side. And speaking of things that don't impact these equilibrium systems, if we add a catalyst to a system that's already at equilibrium, it doesn't actually impact the equilibrium system either. If the system's not yet at equilibrium, all it does is increase the rate of the forward and reverse reactions equally, and the system just achieves equally equilibrium a little bit faster. So the addition of a catalyst and the addition of an inert gas don't actually impact a system already at equilibrium. In some cases, they just help the system achieve equilibrium a little bit faster. So hopefully this video has introduced you to the idea that we can both quantitatively and qualitatively analyze changes to equilibrium systems. First, quantitatively using QC or the reaction quotient in comparison to the equilibrium constant KC to help us figure out first whether or not the system is at equilibrium, and if not, whether it's going to proceed in the forward direction to produce more product or in the reverse direction to produce more reactant in order to achieve equilibrium. And secondly, 
that if we analyze a system that is at equilibrium, using Le Chatelier's principle, we can predict how it is going to respond to a stress, such as a change in concentration, a change in temperature, or a change in pressure, at least with an accompanying change in volume, and how it is going to ultimately re-establish equilibrium. Now moving forward, we're going to take a look at a bit more of a quantitative analysis of equilibrium to figure out if we have a system, what the equilibrium concentrations are going to be. But of course, I'm going to save that for the next video. Thanks for watching.